some signals about fiscal consolidation. And this is something that will continue, but it will not continue until we resolve the crisis facing us, and then we resolve the debt issues. That's how I would approach it. It should be a, a short-term uh, problem that can be solved, but it has to take a bit of time. Thank you, Majority Leader. Uh, thank you for your fantastic questions. During my time, there is no bank that collapsed. I was governor of the Central Bank of Kenya from March 2007 to March to the, to the beginning of March in 2015. That does not mean, uh, uh, Majority Leader Bwanakimani Shongwa, that there were no problems. There were problems. But you have to make sure that you bring in or you develop new solutions and new interventions to save the market. And that's what we did. There, are se there were several mergers, but those mergers were actually uh, geared towards preventing any collapse of the banks because market situations do change. Some uh, projections in marketplace can change. And so the regulator must know what to do. A regulator is not someone who is waving an axe in the market. A regulator is a person who is trying to understand the market, help develop the market, and the third one is regulate and protect the market. So those three dimensions are very, very important for a regulator. And that is what I did for most of the time that I was there. Now, of course, the two the affidavits that have come up, let me comment on them. One, the first point I would like to make, Mr. Chairman and honorable members who have that asked quest, that, this question, is that we want to stop at the, sh at, the, at, the, at the first point of just mentioning what it is. We don't want to go further and see what has happened. The case, for example, for the procurement, I fought it through the courts to the Court of Appeal, and there was a judgment. The case of Grad Regency, I think the statement is that I was adversely mentioned. I was, a a I was an agent of government, and this was a government-to-government -government sale, and that was, I was the one to negotiate and to receive the payment, which was actually received by the government. And for your information, the end result was that it gained 3.114 billion shillings that was actually used in Lamu to dredge the port. The idea in government then was that such recovery from corruption proceeds should be used in uh, fixed investments that would give Kenyans perpetual benefits, and that is how it was located there. There was a commission of inquiry that was started, but it was supposed to check whether the sale was appropriately done. Now, the whole issue was how was it appropriately done? According to that commission, it valued the hotel at 1.8 billion. Then the, the question they were asked, what about the central bank? How did it value the, the hotel? It was at 2.2 billion. And then how much was the hotel sold by the central bank? It was sold at 2.8 billion. The difference between 2.8 billion and 3.114 is because of the retained earnings during the operations. So in a sense, it was value for money. And that was, uh, and that was what the committee was supposed to establish. Let me state this, uh, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, that we are, and especially for me, I've been a victim of abuse of the criminal justice system. For example, the procurement that has been mentioned, the whole idea was to get Johanna Dung out of the central bank. How do you do it? That's why, even if you go to the, to the records, you will just be embarrassed, the kind of facts. Now, the biggest problem I have when I show and the others who have asked the question is that the National Human Rights Commission, uh, the Kenya National Human Rights Commission and the Transparency International should be coming to our aid as victims of abuse of the criminal justice system. But they are coming here to make us the victims. It's quite a paradox. It's, it's actually... Extremely, I, I would like maybe to invite people to read the, even the judgment, even the Commission of Inquiry on Grad Regency. It's so interesting that they find it that they become a, a, a also a victim. 
It is something that we may want to check out, Mr. Chairman. It's something that we have to rethink about the mandate of some, some of these institutions, and it's something that we need to correct from the very beginning. Sorry, Chair. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt the, uh, the good professor, but uh, I feel he's on a tangent now to blame the petitioners. I, I, I just wanted him to clarify, because that was my question, Professor, in the interest of the country and the economy, we want to, if we approve you to approve someone that will be confident, has no issues of integrity hanging over his head. And the opportunity now you have is to make that clear. And that's why I asked the status of the, 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 the Grand Regency, which I have heard you've clearly stated that you, you are exonerated by the Commission of, uh, commission of Inquiry. Um, uh, well, I hear my colleague saying no. So we want to know what was the status, okay. what is the status of the uh, uh, charges on the 1.2 billion uh, tender. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, it's good to say it went yeah. to court or the, okay. you fought it to court Thank of you. appeal. Thank you. What was the verdict? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Yes, uh, the tender issue, let me first of all say that it was very clear that CEOs are not involved in the, ted in the procurement. Their work is only to appoint the procurement committee. And that matter went all the way to the appeal, and they showed that the problem was the procurement committee of the central bank, and I was vindicated. I had no role to play. The, 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 the grad regency, again, is an issue I have shown that the government position was that the proceeds would be invested and they were already invested in, the, in, in, the, in that case. And maybe I can go to, the, so in, in, in actual fact, my role was very, very clear as an agent, and my role was also very, very clear that I had no role to play in procurement. But I wanted to go further to show that actually when such issues come, although I'm trying to defend myself, when such issues come, also those people who bring them up, they should point see of order the, whole, uh, the whole end. Has speaker, to point of order. Uh, the, the, the nominee is not helping us make progress. For instance, he's saying about, talking about being vindicated in the Grand Regency cell. He's not saying by who. Because the report of the commission is clear that you are, you are, you are indicted. Yeah, when I chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with due respect, and uh, maybe I will seek your protection because I have never seen the report. I only remember that the government said those proceeds that the central bank has done well for raising that kind of money, it was invested in Ramuport, and you are aware of that. And the whole conclusion was that if such resources coming from corruption proceeds are invested in the projects that provide perpetual benefits, then everybody is happy. Let me also move on Speaker. to... Sorry. Yes, uh, 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 as, uh, maybe as a procedural matter of guidance to the committee, with all due respect to my colleague, the leader of minority, I don't know when, as a committee, we allude to a report. Is it not in order then as a procedural issue that a copy of that report is shared with the committee so that either the, uh, the nominee or other members of the committee are able to benefit from that? So that, Honorable Speaker, we avoid the um, issues of raising issues uh, to the public gallery. Uh, and I say that with a lot of respect to my brother because the earlier nominee who was here, Professor Kindiki, had the same issue on an issue that my brother was not able to again clear up properly that indeed the allegations were against the law firm of uh, Honest Maskip Chumba Murkomen and Company, not the law firm of Honorable Kindiki. So maybe, uh, Speaker, you could guide us on that issue. There were affidavits, one or two, sent to the committee through the clerk. I instructed that they be furnished to the nominee. I believe you have been served. And I did hear the two members make reference to those affidavits. I would encourage uh, the nominee to answer questions. That's why I said precise and concise. When we go on to a long journey, we end up stumbling somewhere. So I would uh, want you, Professor, the three questions that were asked 
that cast aspersions on your integrity by Chungwa, Wandai, and uh, Junet. Just answer them straight and clear. Are they true? They are not. Was there a court process? How did it end? Did your wife go to Thailand on holiday paid by Imperial Bank? Was it Imperial Bank? If it wasn't, uh, because it's an allegation being raised by Junette, I've seen no evidence that it happened. Do you, is, did it happen or did it not? It's as simple as that. Yeah. Chair, not to interrupt you, Chair, with your indulgence. Also, you know, we are unanswered. The nominee alluded in his response that even the report of the commission made him a victim. He said that when he was responding. So that means he's privy to the commission's report. And even then, uh, I think on the, he was on a, Kenya Human Rights Commission. On a struggle to defend himself, he said he's been a victim <laughs> yes. of many things. Yeah. So now that we have put him on track, let's hear his answers to your questions, which Thank I'm you. sure he's privy to. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I, I get your advice and I'll take, uh, I'll, I'll be in that um, tandem. Let me say that um, in the first issue and the second issue, I, I think what I've said is that I've defended myself in terms of, the, I, I, I defended myself through the court process. The Commission of Inquiry in terms of the Grad Regency, I was asked to surrender the money to dredge the, uh, uh, the, the, the Ramu port. All the proceeds were given. You were asked as Jugunandungu or as Governor of the Central as Bank? As Governor of the Central Bank and also the agent who transacted that particular uh, deal. The printing contract that uh, Mwajmiwa Junet, with due respect, thank you very much, that matter came to Parliament, it was debated, and in the end, it was not the central bank that determined the printing contract because it was there even before I joined in, and so I was exonerated on that, then the reports are very clear. I've never been involved in contract for publishing, for, for, for any currency uh, printing. And again, the Treasury also went uh, into, um, uh, into joint venture with the Deraru, and that is how the issues were determined, so it was not a purview of the Central Bank, and the matter was dissolved that way in the Central Bank. The Imperial Bank never collapsed when I was in the Central Bank. I had already left, and it was several years when I had left. And uh, the bottom line is that I was never part of that, and uh, I never frauded, and also the frauding of uh, 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 the, the procurement rules, I never frauded any rules because in the, the then law, since then they have been revised, and uh, bear me with that, since then the procurement law has been revised. The CEO of an organization, his role was, or his or her role was to appoint the procurement committee. If the procurement committee made a decision, the CEO could not vary that decision. Since then, and I had already left the central bank, I've, uh, things have, been, have, have changed and the law has been revised. Let me also say, the issue of banks propping the sharing, that was not correct. It is like the same situation we are in now. We are having surprise side shocks, and because of the persistent shocks, you can see the dollar, the dollar supply has been minimal. And so in a sense, when you look at our current account deficit, it is the one that signals whether the currency is going to depreciate or appreciate. And that is the same situation with external shocks, and this is consistent with the African e economies. Again, we went through the motion with a uh, special parliamentary committee on that, and we dissolved the matter that actually this was the preference. That is why, Mr. Chairman, I mentioned that I had issues with saying how do we create buffers that help us to mitigate short-term shocks. And um, the, the whole issue, uh, then the, 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 the whole issue of uh, Imperial Bank and my wife going to Thyrad, this is a paid service. It was an agent of uh, that, uh, that, that company that was giving those, uh, uh, the, the services, and it was Did paid. you hear what he asked? Yes. He said, or rather he alleged, that in certain proceedings, the former owner of Imperial Bank alleged 
that he paid for an expensive holiday for your family. When you learned of it, you cut short the holiday, came back and collapsed the bank. That's what he alleged. Yes, and that's, that's what you should mm, respond to. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. The bank collapsed in, 19, in two, uh, 2017, and I was not governor then, and I was even away from the country. I was working from uh, outside the country. So it, it did not collapse in, uh, when I was a governor. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, sir. Yeah, just to, yeah, for your indulgence, Chair. You see, uh, two issues, Chair. The issue of the shilling that I raised, it is true that uh, the, the scenario looks like now. But, uh, Chair, just as a supplementary question, the shilling now is stuck at that level. By that time, a committee of parliament was formed, and I suspect you were in parliament by then. Then, after the investigation of parliament ended in a month or a month and a half, the shilling came back from 120 came back to 90. So it looked like a setup. Then lastly, Chair, did the trip to Thailand happen or did it not happen, in spite of the bank collapsing in 2017? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Let me say this. Once the crisis has been resolved, then there is inflow of foreign exchange. And because we have a, an open capital account and a floating exchange rate, their precision will always take place because their precision is the depreciation is coming because of scarcity, and that's what happened. You can even produce graphs for, to that effect. That is, I wanted to correct that. The trip to Thailand took place in 2014, and uh, the, then the, the agent of uh, of that was uh, himself. Uh, 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 I can't remember the name of uh, the, the one you have mentioned, and he was. We were paying him in advance to go. So it was a trip that was paid for. You pay him. So it took place. We paid. Was he was a travel an agent. agent, yeah. an agent he was what? an agent of that particular uh, resort. And uh, you paid him directly. And then you, and, and, the, and, we, uh, and all those details are there. You pay for the holiday? I paid for that holiday for my wife. Okay. Yes. now have another batch of four. Owen Bayer, Gikaria, Mule, Emase. Yes, uh, can I go ahead, Chair? Yeah. Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 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 to make good progress, Professor, listen to the questions very carefully and answer them as precisely and concisely as you can. Okay. When you embark on a misadventure, you land into a series of problems for no reason. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Uh, th thank you, uh, Speaker and uh, Chair. Uh, for away from the uh, personal issues that, um, of course, you, you've gone through, I want now to focus on what is now and the position that you have been nominated to. We would like to know, as Kenyans, what is your vision as CS for Treasury? You handled the central bank. It was a different institution. It was a regulator. It did many other things. Now you're coming to full public service. You're coming into uh, the ministry, which very many people in this country blame it for the kind of economic mess that we are in. What is your vision for Treasury and economic planning? How are you going to solve the problems that are now here? the problems of uh, uh, you know skyrocketing prices the problems of the fuel the subsidy issue and the hustlers out there are looking at you as the person that are going to redeem them how are you going to do this what is your vision if we know your vision we'll be able to know where you will take us and that you'll have less of the issues that you had at at, at central bank uh, secondly uh, speaker uh, the current cs has pronounced that he cannot disburse money to cdf because he says the court ruled. But we also know the court, and Kenyans know the court ruled on the issue of uh, the CDF Act 2013, not the NGCDF that is subsisting now. Members of parliament and Kenyans know the benefit of having CDF. On the fiat of a, uh, of a ruling, 
on our previous act, Kenyans have been denied that man. Would you disburse CDF? Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Chair. Maybe uh, 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 the nominee Treasury. You, you know, at the end of the day, it is what is collected that has to be spent. So as, as Parliament, we will do budgets, the government, the executive will do a lot of budgets. But at the, at the end of the day, is what is collectable that can be able now to trans translate and actualize the policy and the government uh, uh, expenditure that is there. So, uh, and uh, one of the issues that has come up of late is that taxation has been politicized to an extent that uh, uh, some, they, some people look like they are being targeted. So one of the questions among politicizing tax collection is that uh, our revenue collection currently, uh, uh, which stands at 2.2 trillion this financial year, but the debt, public debt is so huge. So uh, what innovations are you, strategies that you're going to have uh, to employ and grow that revenue collection of this country without necessarily, you know, just uh, thinking of taxation to the poor or getting a lot of money. Uh, which other methodology would you come up with to collect enough money to be able to meet our budget uh, requirement? Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Speaker. Uh, thank you, Professor. Honorable uh, Mule Matungulu. At the current situation in the country economically, uh, we are under serious distress of hardship economically, and we would wish to hear from you as the person to turn around the situation. How will you put the directive which has been given by the president of cutting down the costs of the budget by 300 billion in 2022-2023 budget to allow relief for Kenya spending and borrowing pressure and at the same time look at that vis-a-vis -vis the intention of job cuts within the country Whereas when campaign trail was on, we promised that we are going to grow the economy as quickly as possible in the framers of bottom-up. Yes, the job cut to make sure that this realization of the 300 billion is evident. And it will definitely affect serious programs of the government like private public private partnership PPPs whereby the framework is rests squarely with Treasury. How are you going to seek that with the particular ministries which will be involved in all the PPEs to save this country? Thank you. Emase. Thank you. Uh, to the nominee, what is your take on the President's push for the National Social Security Fund contribution to be enhanced, considering the hard times where every Kenyan is concerned about the rising cost of living? What's your take on that? Professor, you can answer those four, then we take another batch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman. I'm very sorry also for uh, moving into different direction. Perhaps it's the teacher in me. I never left anything unanderstood because um, the, the, that is my, but I, I'll try to be as, uh, as uh, precise as possible. Thank you so much, uh, Owen, uh, Owen Bayer, for that uh, question. The vision for Kenya. We, we do know that we have very serious short term constraints. But let me say that in terms of the vision, I can pinpoint four areas that we are going to work on 
And obviously those areas are going to give us a very strong economy in the, in the, from the medium term to long term. Once we solve the short term constra constraints. And the first one being brief is actually that we have to start by protecting private investments. And this is the whole area of human capital development. Our education system, for example, our health system, the health infrastructure has been devoured by COVID-19. We didn't anticipate the, the extent to which our health infrastructure can be tested. We not even beyond even what we have health financing. And the third aspect of that is actually nutrition outcomes. And this is actually, again, food markets and how we can actually grow the human capital development arena. That for us is going to be very important. And it starts from fixing the problems in health, in education, and in food systems, which you improve the nutrition outcome. That's one whole bucket of where we have to do some major issues in the medium term. The second one, which needs to start at the, at the, at the, when everything, even when things are as uh, severe as they are, is, Mr. Chairman, to develop, to regulate, and protect markets. And this, this is where things have gone wrong, go, gone wrong and I'm sure, Mwesh uh, Mwabaya, you can also come up with so many examples. If markets are not properly governed, then it means that they cannot distribute the economic rent in the marketplace. If we don't develop the markets, then most people are not going to reach the markets. To give you an example, it is markets provide signals, especially for increased production downstream and productivity downstream. That is the bottom of the people who are working there, be it in agriculture, be it in another sector. But what you see upstream is increased incomes. So it, it means that we can actually, in the very short term, try to start fixing markets. And for me, that is a very major issue. Let me tie the second point also. The third point is also tied to what uh, my dear sister uh, asked in terms of, sorry, so uh, my friend asked about the current situation. The third area is actually domestic resource mobilization. We still, we, we have, this is a family of instruments that we can actually optimize the tax instruments, for example. He talked about even criminalizing taxation. It's because we need to optimize taxation, uh, uh, tax instruments. And we need to come up and develop the family of instruments in the domestic resource mobilization space to improve our revenue, uh, our revenue base. But then coming back to you, I remember the, the last time I visited this issue was 2001. I was analyzing how to optimize uh, taxation on excisable products, and one of them was alcohol. And I showed that you can actually optimize it by knowing that if you go, every tax system has a lava curve. You can actually optimize if you know exactly the demand structure of the product. So our tax system, uh, and, and even tax instruments, can be optimized on the basis of the structure of the targeted product that, that they, are, they are getting. And that is in consistent with the question that uh, was asked by um, Buana Rukaria. It, it means we can build the, the base. And finally, in this space, uh, Bonambaya and uh, the questions that have been raised, I do believe that we have succeeded in the digital evolution. We have taken part in that. The digital evolution has worked for us. Everybody is now talking about the fourth industrial revolution. The beauty about it is that it is going to coordinate all the other factors that I've mentioned. The, the, the protecting uh, the private investment, protecting, developing, protecting and regulating markets, domestic resource mobilization will be coordinated by the digital space and the fourth industrial revolution. We are going to see a lot of that. These issues need not wait for us to resolve the crisis. They will start in earnest. But let me tell you that if they are going to spin the economy and we are going to see a lot of benefits. That means that I have also looked at the issues, uh, Muheshmi Rukaria, you have mentioned. Thank you very much. And the most important thing is to make sure that, that I'm not going back to the history of creating social contracts. I'm in the, in the, in the quad, uh, quadrant of saying, Actually, you can raise incentives for you paying taxes if 
taxes are not high enough for you to dodge them. You know, the other day, Mr. Chairman, I asked the KRA, why do you believe that high tax rates will give you high tax revenue? Wherever, whereas the whole world knows that that's the converse. And we are back to the question that is being raised. Let's look at every tax instrument in terms of how we can optimize it. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your questions. The economic situation is terrifying. The, three, the four issues that I have identified are very, very important for us to turn around. But we turn around with also two very important points. One of them is actually how to strengthen our institutions. Be they the institutions that regulate the market, the institutions that protect the market. There are two very important characteristics of institutions that I work for and I really like to achieve. One of them is to define the legal, the, the legal framework or the, game, the rules of the game. And the second one is actually to define appropriate incentives. And a combination of the legal framework and uh, appropriate incentives, that is the reward system, you are rewarded when you do well, you are penalized when you do badly. It's, it's consistent with the issues that uh, uh, Jeanette, uh, Buhashmi Jeanette was raising and, uh, uh, and uh, Buanai Shongwa. Then you are going to encourage prudent behavior in the marketplace. This is where we are, and that is how things will work and will work positively. I do believe that some of these are medium term solutions, but most of them are short term. We start now in creating a, a very important base, and we'll get there. So thank you very much, Chairman. Mr. Batch. Chairman, on the question of CDF, I didn't hear anything. Professor. It's the CDF. Yes, CDF. I, 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 I was uh, And it, it is so easy. Yeah. The are most you one? Thank you. I don't understand to go academic again. <laughs> he said CDF is very important. Even the head of state has acknowledged that. If and when you are confirmed as Minister for the Treasury, are you going to honor, respect, and disperse CDF to Parliament? Thank you, thank you, Chairman. You have made it very clear for me. But I, I will use the, I will be guided by the law, and I will abide by the law because essentially that is what uh, we'll do. But I will honor that as per the law demands. Thank you very much. Yes. I see. Now, uh, yes, uh, there's a point of. Yes, Speaker, allow me to uh, chair. Now let me call you Speaker because you are Speaker. Allow me. I would to... rather you seek clarification other yeah, than point clarification of order to, uh, because it's not a debate. Okay. Yes. Uh, well guided clarification. What did the professor say you about CDF? Abide by the law. Abiding by the law, saying we're saying what? He said he will look speaker, at the law. Uh, let me let me be remind guided you. appropriately and if then I, pay. What did he say? That's what he said. What? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Is that so? Is that not Gingereza Mingi? What we say, Speaker? No, no, no. Let me let, let us only miss the point. What if Bobaya said the truth? Seek your clarification. What, that's why I'm helping. Maybe he, yes. he left the point that yes. what was what was quashed in in court is actually a different law, CDF Act. What we have now, Speaker, is not CDF Act. We have national government constituency development fund. Now he was asked. How quickly are you going to use that to disband the funds? Kizungu Mingi, I this speaker. Okay, uh, you'll start with that, but let's take another batch of four. Okay. Then you can uh, clarify to Honorable Posing what he seeks to be clarified. Morugara, Daud, uh, Amisi, and uh, Naisula. I'll come to you, guys, gentlemen. Just hold your horses. Thank you. And uh, I want to be strict on one, one question, question each. Yeah. Thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, just before I ask the question is a little bit of uh, economics that we are getting from uh, the nominee. And Kenyans are listening to us so that they are able to understand what the nom nominee is promising them in a very plain English language. My question is this. We have heard a uh, hue and a cry out there that the country does not have money. And therefore, we are in trouble. 
what is your position as a senior economist in the country, a former governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, do we have the money, which means soon we may be out of the doldrums where we are, or we do not have any money, therefore we have to tighten our belts because worse things are ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Speaker. Uh, speaker, I, the, to the nominee, uh, I don't know if he would be aware that his peers or the peers in the uh, Treasury has already instructed the police department to, uh, to return vehicles, 204 vehicles back which were leased were during the elections and uh, the policy, if that is the policy which would be there, it would be very wrong. Uh, regarding dollar deposits, uh, Chair, uh, we are being told that there is no money like my colleague has asked, but uh, it was in the public domain that the do dollar deposits in Kenya are at an all-time high People in Kenya have got dollar deposits in dollar accounts in Kenya to the tune of 915 billion, uh, I don't know it's dollars or shillings, but it's the highest, it's double. And people are hoarding dollars in Kenya. So there is no, the rate we are now looking at as of today is 121 which has been created artificially. Can the governor tell us uh, how he would handle that? Because once that comes into the market, then the, the balance of trade and the payments, will, everything will go down. But until and do, you do not tackle those cartels, or is it how would we get those people, that dollars into the market at a lower rate? Thank you. Daud, you have said so much just to ask a question, you know. I'm <laughs> easy. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. I know it's good to tax before you take off, but uh, try and take off without excessive taxing. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, this is a position that uh, uh, Kenyans are waiting for. Uh, because uh, even the occupant of this position is required to exercise the highest epitome of financial management. And uh, looking at uh, what you furnish us with, Professor, declaration of wealth. Uh, first of all, Chair, I think we need to also make a clarification to this uh, uh, net worth issue. Because uh, even Kimani Chunga will agree with me, net worth is your total assets minus total liabilities. But I think what has been quoted before is not the case. Nevertheless, if you look at your what you've quoted, family home, farm with house, holiday home, basically those are homes. A total, whether it's a family home, holiday home, leisure home, they are homes. Uh, the total is 400 million. Somebody will ask, before even going to the rest, out of 941, 400 goes to homes. Is this the advice we are going to give to Kenyans, that half of your health is ho a home? Uh, because that's where management of resources and uh, the gauge to how you can run our economy. It starts with you as an individual. Uh, you look at the the list of the he wealth. I don't know whether you came here by walking, because there's no car listed. But according to my knowledge, a car is an asset. And this is the Ke a person Kenyans wants to see exercising the highest epitome of financial management. And it is starts with what you present to this committee. I want you to clarify, even these shares, piece of agriculture land, how many acres, investment financial instrument, what is the shares or dividends? investment in through family company 400 million what is it that is 400 million shares in a bank which bank imperial which one which one is this bank so this is how a kenya is going to gauge of the individual that is going to be at the highest financial management institution really we need to be serious uh, miss you have made statement what is your question i yeah. one whether he owns a car because not stated there. Two, 
But is he obligated to own a car? There are many people who don't own cars. The, the statement My, the of The most distinguished lawyer called John Hamino doesn't know how to drive, doesn't own cars, but he travels. <laughs> I think the professor can just answer what he can on my, my description. He knows what I'm talking about. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Speaker, yeah, yeah. Uh, Honorable Camino, your friend doesn't own those kinds of homes also. Those homes <laughs> require cars. <laughs> uh, Naisula, in the last in this batch. Thank you, Chair. I promise not to weep or be long in this one. So, to the nominee, the number of unemployed youths in Kenya is estimated at 14%, according to the International Labour Organization, and as many as 5.2 million youth adults are unable to find meaningful employment, a pressing concern to policymakers. So, my question to you is how do you intend to turn things around to grow the economy? to specifically secure the millions of jobs that the Kenya Kwanza government promised our youths. Professor, you can deal with those four. Thank you, Chairman and uh, Honorable Members, for those questions. And let me start with uh, the issue of CDF. And I said that um, I'll be guided by the law because we have to uh, we have to say the commitments must be made, but of course they must be consistent with the law. Muhesh uh, Junet actually said uh, there have been a finance committee that has also been talking to the treasury. They cannot spend more than they are allowed by the law, so we'll be consistent with the law. That is my answer. I don't know which laws the the, the, the court ruling is, is a question of checking on that and saying that are we uh, and we are going to consult also in the relevant uh, organizations of government so that everything is clear but we cannot fail to honor if the law also permits that, that, that that's my my simple answer for that uh, and thank you very much uh, uh, Murugara. Uh, I think I, I, I do understand uh, and, 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 and we, are in a, we are starting from a very difficult situation. And so when you are in a difficult situation, how do you get out of the difficult situation? Uh, His Excellency the President has been using a very nice phrase of, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Try to get out. You know? So essentially, there are some short-term issues that we we'll deal with. That's why I started by saying, the current thinking by the government right now, which I borrow, which I buy quite a lot, and I have a lot of discussions with the donors. We were, for example, with the donors who are providing food relief. We argued that we may need concessional borrowing, which will help us remove the very expensive domestic debt. And then once we, that is done, the fiscal space will start building, and then we can start signaling fiscal consolidation. If the government doesn't have fiscal space, it means that it cannot finance the environment. Those, that's the main issue, and that is the main spin that we, we want to make sure that we have. If I had the time, one day I can talk about the crowding out, because it actually affects everyone. So it's, a, it's something, but how do we resolve it? It's actually coming back to trying to create fiscal flexibility by the government so that it will do that. And when I'm, uh, when, uh, if this committee approves me, that is the goal that I will start moving towards, fiscal flexibility so that we jump into specifics and uh, trying to help out. And um, the, thank you, uh, Muheshmiya Daoud. I didn't know that there were 200 vehicles leased out, but again, it's something that I would, I would look at. Let me say this, when the crisis was start, started biting, and especially the whole world, it's only the U.S. Fed that actually started tightening their monetary policy. And you can see, even the uh, euro started being affected because they were not following suit. When everybody followed suit, there was a whole tightening, even in Kenya here. And so the signaling is that there will be scarcity of dollars. So the dollars that you mentioned uh, in terms of deposits, they are owned by individuals. And so everybody moves into a different, a different direction because they are anticipating that there will be tightening. So the whole issue is to say, once the crisis is over, we are going to see dollar flows. The other day I was talking even to several farms, like even tea, tea exporters. They are stockpiling their quantity. 
the Ukraine, Ukrainian crisis is such that we cannot export the products that we used to export there. We cannot take tea to uh, Pakistan, for example, because of the fraud. So there is a, a bit of a, a, sh a shock in terms of the supply. So we are not getting the dollar froze. But I do believe that it will come through. You have mentioned about the cartels. This is again something I went back to, to talking about markets. How do we develop markets? How do we regulate markets? How do we protect markets? And why you protect markets is because of the, 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 the cartels. And you are right. And this is something that I mentioned as a very important second pillar that we are going to deal with. So the situation will be uh, dealt with uh, in, in that way. Yes, I understand your point about financial management. If you are an investor, you look at what is the appropriate returns at a particular time, and you change over time. What I was required to provide is my net worth given the current situation. Why do people invest in homes? Because they have saved returns. If tomorrow manufacturing sector is better, we will invest there. As an investor, and this, by the way, is, an in, is a whole congregate of my family and myself, including the cars that we own. We did not break them down. Okay? I came here with a, a, a company car, which is an international organization, so essentially that's why you didn't find specifics. But the most important thing is to tell you that even yourself, you'll wake up tomorrow to invest on the basis of the returns that you see. If the information in the market shows that you're not going to, you're going to get into a loss, you are going to change your investment pattern. So if I observe your investment today, they will be different with the next 10 years to come. And that is the composition. That is what it is all about. Once we create a boom in other sectors of the economy, we'll find everybody uh, frocking into those areas and start uh, earning economic rents from them. Um, thank you very much uh, for talking about the unemployed youth. And the essence, and I shared, because I talked to, uh, I started with by I raised those, some of those issues. I talked about Chairman. markets because I wanted to make it very clear Chairman, that it is, the, it is the, it is the, yes, uh, it is. Miss. Uh, sorry for interruption, but uh, where we need to be very keen is the net worth, because it is a repeated question. Can the professor tell us in his understanding what is net worth? and where is his liability in this statement? Uh, I think what I provided was the net worth. I have no liabilities that uh, I, I, I uh, sorry. I calculate, I, I, by the time I move out, um, I, 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 I am asked for the net worth, that is what I computed and provided. Yeah. Then I wanted to go back to the youth issue because the youth issue is very, very important. And uh, I think, Madam, uh, Madam, the whole issue, what I talked about the markets is that is the kernel of bottom up approach. I, I called feel, Honorable Naisula. Na, Naisula, I didn't, I didn't write, <laughs> write, yes. the, write the name, it was so fast. Thank you so much. But the whole idea, look, look at it this way. We have looked at the youth issue from even the demographic transition, from very, very, very many dimensions. But we do believe, and I strongly believe, and I agree with the government here, and the, the bottom-up approach is that once we structure the market, once we develop different markets in different segments of the economy, and once we actually protect those markets and govern them well, then it means that you can join in the market and make a living. There will be interventions that may be required for you to participate in that particular market. And that's why everybody is talking about the manifesto for Kenya Kwanzaa where we talk about the Hasra Fund. The Hasra Fund is a, an intervention to help you join in that market. We do believe that most of our youth have a lot of potential. But they need interventions or support to get into those markets. Given that as we move in that direction, I can promise you the demographic dividend will be, will be in sight for us. But the most important thing is to say that those markets where they participate in is where we want to provide interventions, and that is what is going to happen. And the interventions are creating appropriate funds, but also creating appropriate ventures, uh, market uh, signals that are going to help in terms of that market, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I hope I was brief. Raso, Honorable Shuriye, on Emasa, you have already had a bite. Uh, 
Robert Mbui, Ferdinand, Mishi, and Koich. We'll take now more than four professor so that you answer and respond to all of them. So start with Honorable Raso, Honorable Shurie, Honorable Ferdinand, Honorable Mbui, Honorable Mishi, and Honorable Koich. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Professor, by Kenyan standards, you are a wealthy man. If I go to your pro bono, uh, development of two classes at Gathange Primary, 250,000, develop two classrooms at Gacharage, Gacharage Dispensary, uh, 20,000. Uh, that adds up to 620,000. Uh, if I look at your net wealth, that is 0.006%. Uh, what is your philosophy on wealth creation and pro prosperity sharing? Because you say you represent the hustlers. Uh, Finally, question at a time. Finally, uh, there is this move in the UK where the new chancellor advised uh, the prime minister on the economics, and it has really caused a big hue and cry in the UK that they say that that government must go. What do you uh, say about the president saying? Uh, that we must first tax wealth based on actually what you have supplied the committee this morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Uh, Professor, um, we've had one issue that we've been grappling with with the, uh, the National Assembly is the application of Article 223 by the National Treasury. In your view, what do you think is the remedy available to the legislature in the circumstances where such expendi expenditures do not meet the threshold of, of a supplementary budget as espoused in the article, the PFM Act and its attendant regulations? Very good, Fernand. One question. The two, but I didn't restrict myself to one. Um, the local blame game, uh, Professor, is that the government wastage and the huge public uh, bills that uh, we see around, and that is actually contributing to the huge uh, recurrent expenditure. In your view, for us to be able to grow, what do we need to do to reduce the current expenditure in the government for the economy to grow? I think let let this come up because I know that um, that's a the local blame can huge government uh, uh, wastage. Thank you. Robert uh, Mbui. Yeah, yeah, thank, you, thank you, Chair. Uh, the nominee has uh, severally mentioned the bottom-up, and I have heard it being mentioned also and touted as an economic model. And now a proposal to come up with a fund that you are calling the Asla Fund. Kindly explain very clearly what is the difference between that fund and the Uwezo Fund, which has been in existence without interest, uh, the Youth uh, Enterprise Fund, which is, exists without interest, Women Enterprise Fund, all those funds. What is the difference between those and the Hustler Fund? And Chair, Chair, I want you to look at the declaration of wealth form that uh, the nominee has given us. Uh, he's indicated in the description of properties that he owns uh, eight items. The last item, uh, Chair, is shares in a bank. And that part has been left blank. Was it deliberate? Because you've indicated yourself shares in a bank, but you have not put a figure. <clears throat> was the next was uh, Mishi? Sorry, Mishi, I was checking a document. Yeah, thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable Chair, away from slashing the 300 billion from the budget, it has been talked that the KRA 
the KRA is going to be pushed to collect around three trillion. And some of the option, it is in the name of expanding the tax bracket. My question is, how do you assure Kenyans, the poor Kenyans, those the Kenya Kwanza refer them as hustlers, that, that they are not going to be the target of the carry in terms of expanding tax bracket. And in the same perspective, how do you intend to resolve tax collection disputes in a humane manner without affecting our revenue targets? In the past, Honorable Chair, tax collection has been politicized in a way that some government officers have been aggressively demanding for taxes from Kenyans without considering their plight and sustainability of their businesses. I thank you, Honorable Speaker. Mine is on uh, uh, fiscal uh, distress. We gather that the country is in a very bad shape at the moment, that today um, our credit rating is actually affected. And it is estimated that our total uh, debt constitutes 67.4 percent of our nominal GDP, which roughly translates to 8.8 .8 trillion. It is also estimated that our debt service now stands at 1 trillion. The cost of interest on our debt is now the single largest expenditure item on the recurrent budget, and it is threatening to paralyze the operations of both levels of government. In your view. Um, Mr. Uh, Nomini, what factors have planned the country into such huge fiscal distress and what innovative ways will you put in place to deal with this debt? Thank you. Yes, Professor. Those thank you, the... thank you. Thank you, Chairman and Honorable Members. A fantastic questions that have come through. Let me try to see how I get them through out. And um, let me start with um, the question that was raised on pro bono. Uh, and pro bono is you actually invest your, 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 your flows. You don't invest. Uh, you are trying to support some targeted groups. And uh, I think maybe the figures were not correct because the two classrooms that were done were 2.1 million. And it may, some of them may have been spaced. But what I'm really saying is that I, uh, I, was a, I, I am a private individual, and uh, what I was doing is to use my froze because you cannot invest through, you cannot disrode your assets to invest in pro bono. It's in froze on the basis of request and verified request. So that continues, and as long as uh, they are verifiable requests. For me, I was supporting schools because I do believe that, and especially polytechnics because I do believe that the youth can find their way. So essentially, I don't have a lot of allocation uh, with, uh, because one of the things I have to do is to educate my children, and I have been doing that. Obviously, you do that. You actually pro pro provide pro bono on the basis of the balances that you have. Then you are right about um, uh, the, the, the advice to the government, and obviously, different aspects. Let me put it this way: I would like to encourage the KRA to participate in taxing where there is a boom, the sector that is booming, it should also participate. But those taxes should not distort the market. They should not distort the allocation of resources. They should not create incentives to run away from taxes. And those are the principles that we would, we would want to promote. And once we promote that, I'm sure the tax system is going to work very well. And it's also consistent with Man, uh, Muhammad, uh, sorry, Muheshmiwa Mishi in terms of saying the poor are not going to be target. We are actually going to make sure that the taxation system should make sure that it does not distort the market does not create incentive for you to run away. But it should create a very efficient way. For example, I talked about the digital platforms. They are going to help us in terms of correcting taxes in a way that doesn't also distort the market structure and even the demand structure of the products in question. For me, that is very, very important. How do we structure that? We structure that in terms of consultation, in terms of how the market is, how the structure of demand in the market, and also how the economic situation is. For example, you saw that during the COVID, there were quite a, quite a lot of consideration from so many organizations, including banks, in terms of lowering the, 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 the effects of, 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 uh, of, of, of the impact of the tax. Um, 
application of 223, this is uh, a difficult concept, but it's uh, essentially the whole issue, and uh, I think I borrow also from uh, Mwajimia Junet, who said that the Parliamentary Committee on Finance and even Budget, they all observe, they are watching in terms of what is happening. I think the most important thing is to make sure that the expenditures or the functional expenditures are also consistent with the rate down law, and that is going to be very, very important. And this has happened, and uh, the government is trying to swim, the current government, even in its own transition, is trying to swim through it. But what solutions? Every day, when you have a problem, you generate solutions of what should be done. It is now tightening the whole issue of how much, on, and the parliament is actually going to be responsible for this to try to say how much, what flexibility do you have even, w even within the article 223. You're not changing the law, but you're changing the guidelines. And I do believe that guidelines work well to shape the current constraints, to shape the market consideration, and also to guide us in terms of where we should be. And I do believe that is uh, fantastic. I do agree with you in terms of wastage, uh, Ferdinand. But we have to ask ourselves, how do we achieve the best results? We have to start talking about how do we prioritize the areas that we want to target and invest in? And how do we target those areas in terms of uh, what we have done? And finally, how do we monitor and evaluate the results? Because they have to be consistent with the results. So we have to create that awareness in terms of the, ta the, prior the priorities we want to have and list the priorities. Some of those priorities can be time bound. And then we want to see whether we have results. Can we evaluate that? And if the whole that's going to improve the tax correction. And that is why I do believe that is extremely important. Uh, um, uh, uh, yeah. uh, speaker, I'm not to satisfy the answer. Just a clarification. Yeah, because we are talking about the government um, massive uh, wastage and huge uh, public, uh, I mean, salaries and what have you. So, what are you going to do to tame that? That's what has been a blame game out here. Uh, so, you just told, you have told me the the yeah. scenario as it is. Thank you, so Chair. what are you going to do mm. if I have to make you the minister for... Huh? <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I alluded to this area and I said that one of the things is actually to understand where, the, where, where did the rain beat you. The first thing is to make sure that you have stringent measures in terms of containing that. I argued earlier that we need to come up with some concessional funding to actually try to resolve the current constraints. Once you are out of those constraints, then you come down to prioritize which areas, which wastage, for example, what you're really saying, can we cut? And how do we restrict those? How do we create uh, formidable regulations and guidelines in terms of curtailing those wastage? But right now, you have to get out of the problem we are in. I do know that the wage bill is quite, is, is quite high. Then the next thing, what do you need to do with the wage bill? What kind of rationalization measures do you need to do? The promise I am uh, giving you right now is to say that whatever areas that we focus on, we want to make sure that we have sustainable uh, footprint in terms of policy, in terms of actions, in terms of guidelines. That is the only way we can survive to the next uh, decade if we have sustainable guidelines, sustainable frameworks that can be test tested over time. And that is the way I was trying to approach it, so that I don't want to specifically talk about any issue, wage, wage bill on, on all that, but I'm really saying that we need to come up and prioritize. We need to target. But in all those actions, they have to be sustainable. They have to be seen to be sustainable and time-bound. And that is going to be very, very important. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, then I was uh, going to uh, uh, Mishi and the KRA, I think I've talked about that. The Kenyans, the, 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 we cannot target when you are in, um, in a, such a, a dire situation, when poverty is biting and cost of living is rising. That is not the time to increase taxes or retarget taxes. That is the time to look at areas where you can provide the interventions. So it means that when I talked about the bottom-up approach, I was talking about 
those areas that you participate in, those markets, we need to regulate them. Most of the, most of the time, the poor and in the markets they participate in, it's not because they don't work hard. They work hard, but they are, the market is captured. That elite capture itself diminishes the economic rent that you should otherwise get. And it's an area that we are going to talk about and try to fix. But the other thing I, I promised and also talked about, when I talked about the digital space, we have worked so well. We have seen that we can use the retail electronic payments platform to actually pay taxes. When it was started, everybody was very happy about it. It removes that personal interaction between the taxman and the taxpayer. And we have seen, even in one of the papers that I've pre prepared in, in the last two, three years or so, it showed that some of those taxes that uses the payments platform are actually performing much better. The whole issue is to try and see how do we protect that goose that trade the golden egg. That is the, ba the main point, and that is the policy of taxation that I came up with, I talked about, please do not raise tax rates to the point where it becomes in an inducement for you to evade taxes. That is, you are killing the goose that trade the golden egg unless you want to say bye-bye to the golden egg. Um, thank you very much about this growing uh, this uh, fiscal distress and the debt. Last December, we had a special issue of Ajano where we talked about growing with debt. So essentially, it's an area that I'm quite comfortable with. When the HIPIC initiative was started in 1997 by the IMF, the first paper in that book was our, our paper. And we argued that external debt is a major problem. So we didn't know that domestic debt would also become a major problem. So we are in the same space. We have to look for avenues and solutions to make sure that it works. And that is what we want to make sure that it works. Um, I think, um, uh, I think, um, uh, Bui, I, I, the, the Hasra Fund. Yes, uh, Mary and Masa, Honorable. Yes, uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, I need to remind the Domini he hasn't addressed my question. I think just to refresh his mind, my question was on the push to enhance uh, contributions for NSSF in view of the prevailing uh, economic, economic situation. Yeah. How will it in any way alleviate the situation? What are your thoughts on it? You have not addressed it. Thank you. Thank you. I was coming to it, maybe is the way I wrote my notes. We'll finish with Mbui then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mbui, let me come to you. And uh, the Hasra Fund is an intervention. The biggest problem with the intervention is that when you make it special that other people cannot uh, join in, it becomes a problem. It is the entry point that we really need to unraise. And especially the targeted market and how you, and this is going to be constructed on the basis that it is targeting specific group of people in different sectors of the economy, and the entry points must be clear and, access and, uh, and, and understood. And this is, the biggest problem is that it, it is not, a, 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 an intervention should not be for everyone, but how do you actually prevent that uh, it, uh, everyone joins in, or how do you make sure that it works? It is the guidelines that you're going to prevent. And I'm sure once the Hasra Fad and the whole product is developed, you'll see that, and I'm sure you'll have a chance to uh, interrogate it and see how it is going to be done. Uh, the creation, I think I made a mistake. The, the, last, the last part was lumped with the, with, 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 um, with the, the, the shares in a bank with the other investments. So it's, it's a mistake that it was put as a number on its own. But um, uh, of course, I, I wouldn't uh, w w w w want to say that there was an error. It is just the, the numbering that was a mistake. Um, I think uh, we go back, uh, sorry that your question was uh, uh, not missed. The whole issue was um, uh, how, do we, how do we look at NSSF? Is it, how is it going to save you if it's your future retirement benefits? Some of us in our working life, what we have done is to make sure that we match what the employer has given you, we match it. What you are really doing is to safeguard your future. What we need to do is to come back and start talking, that is consultation, and saying, how much would you be prepared 
to actually save. So essentially it's not a punishment, it's you are saving for the future. And uh, that is something that we can actually deal with and say, what is the optimal level of your sacrifice today to help you in future? The, the whole issue of savings and raising savings in Africa, and especially in Kenya, is a major debate because you cannot invest if you have no savings. So the whole issue is to come back to you as a worker and ask, how much are you willing to save now? If your employer is giving you this much, can you match it or even pay more than that? You are safeguarding your future, and that is something that is a democratic choice for most people, but it's also important to make sure that we have an awareness so that there is no targeting. It's not saying that we need this number. What we actually need is savings. How much do you want to save, and what do you want to save for? And that is, has been a major issue around us. Thank you, Professor. I want us to close here, unless there's something really burning, Jeanette. I give you 30 seconds. Uh, one minute, Chair. Chair, this is a very important issue because, Chair, you, if the, the nominee is uh, approved, now this is one of the ministry that is going to have the highest interaction with Parliament because of the budget, budget making process. And I had asked that question, but it was not answered because of Article 221. And the article says, uh, nominee, and this is the same thing that was reminded your predecessors. Rotich, when he came for vetting, he said he's going to engage. This is the, the, the longest serving chairman of budget committee now is the majority leader. This has been uh, this has been the biggest problem between parliament and treasury, and it has not been resolved. So I want to put it to you whether you will be the one, if you are no, uh, approved, you are the one who will resolve it. It says the National Assembly shall consider the, the estimate submitted under clause one, together with the estimate submitted by the Parliamentary Service Commission the Chief Registrar of the Judiciary under Article 127 and 173. And four, before the National Assembly considers the estimates of the, of the revenue expenditure, a committee of the Assembly shall discuss and review the estimate and review, shall discuss and review, review the estimates and make recommendations not to Treasury but to the Assembly. Now what happens normally, Treasury, they go and make their budget estimates and bring it to Parliament. And they want to force Parliament to pass the estimates as they have brought it. And if you don't do it, they, they go and tell the president. Then the president summons the budget committee and tells them, this is my budget. But the constitution says the, the National Assembly should review and submit it to the assembly. It is the, if, if there are things that need to be changed, then the assembly will discuss it with the budget committee. Then at the floor of the house, they can agree that this is the budget we are going to, to pass. This has been a bad practice in our country. But I know many, are you willing to change so that Parliament can have its leeway, its freedom to discuss the budget and pass it within the Assembly? Yes, Majority. Ch Chair, with your indulgence, Another maybe just, just to seconds. put in better context what the Honourable Junet is saying, uh, uh, CS nominee. Parliament indeed uh, considers what Junet is saying in line with the Constitution through the BPS. But the main challenge has been uh, uh, deviation from what is passed on as a budget policy statement because it also includes estimates and ceilings. When you table your annual estimates, it is completely different from what was passed as a budget policy statement. So maybe just to paraphrase what Junette is asking, are you going to commit that what then is agreed on as a budget policy statement because that is what you commit to and that is what the house passes that then you will ensure that your annual estimates are in line with that budget policy statement and it goes along with you as a nominee into ensuring that you stick to what you intend to do because again the other biggest pro big problem we've had is the abuse of article 223 of the constitution and, and I have engaged you in another fora, and you know where the current National Treasury, CS, has committed close to 200 billion shillings over and above what has been approved by Parliament without approval of Parliament. Therefore, uh, maybe I should also add that as a question. Are you also committing that in case you are approved, we shall see to an end, an end to the abuse of Article 223? because it is reserved for things that are of emergency in nature, uh, not to pay for land like the Ruaraka land scandal, uh, maybe for information. 
the Ruaraka land scandal emanated from Article 223. It's something that was done especially around this time when there, there are no committees of parliament yet set up just before an election or immediately after an election. Uh, are we going to see an end to that abuse of Article 223? Sure. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Honorable members, and thank you very much, Muhashima uh, uh, Junet. Let me say this. History is very, very important because we are told that if you forget your history, you'll be condemned to repeat it. And I'm guided about what has happened in the past and how we can actually have a good start in terms of clarity of issues and also clarity of regulations that are set. I do believe, and I come from that private sector background and that uh, thinking that uh, once the government sets the right guideline, it gives the private sector periods of policy clarity. And that is what you are really asking for because once the budget is done in the wrong way, then it affects also the, uh, the, 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 the projections by the private sector. But I can see, and you know that, we had sleepless nights in our, in our technical committee when we realized the whole of 200 billion, which actually cannot be justified. The whole thing is that it is history that is going to teach us the lesson. We have government led by His Excellency President William Ruto, which is actually saying, look, we have to follow the law. We have to follow the guidelines that we create. And we have to make sure that at the end of the period, we are evaluated on the basis of that. And I think uh, those are the issues that I will follow with strictness. Uh, Jeanette, uh, Muheshmiwa Junet and Muheshmiwa Ishongwa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. We shall end here. Mukami, you have missed the boat today. You'll uh, have the first bite in the next, unfortunately. But you had some interventions. Uh, Professor, I give you three minutes to tell us your final wish to this committee and expectation. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I would have said that uh, um, also I work with rational expectations. So my first wish was that I do hope that uh, I've made some commitments and even some content that allows you to actually consider my uh, nomination positively. But more importantly, we run from the past and we run from the past, that is adaptive running, we run from the past so that it guide us in the, in the future. When you have been beaten in the past, you have to make sure that you correct the situation in the future. I do believe correctively, together with the, uh, the national treasury and, uh, and economic planning, and the parliamentary, because essentially we'll be consulting now and then, we can make a difference in terms of where we are going, and of course, make sure that we rectify or leave down that bad history. And I do believe that we are going to make a difference. So my prayer is that once I'm nominated, one, once I'm ratified as a, or um, approved by this committee, I'll make sure that I use all avenues, all my strength, and uh, I've been there uh, in terms of uh, the, all my intellectual might, and all consultations necessary so that we all come up with the appropriate rules, appropriate solutions, and appropriate outcomes. I do believe in consultation. I don't think there is any one person who has the monopoly of knowledge. What we do have is consultation that improves the whole spectra of the issues that we want to cover, our development agenda, and then that will make a difference. Thank you very much for giving me a chance. Thank you very much for listening to me. And thank you very much for, uh, I hope I did answer all your questions and where I failed, I'm sure we'll meet in uh, some other avenues and I will make sure that I clarify some of the issues that I, I had. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you very much. Professor, uh, as we release you, you'll align us with our secretariat, the two, three documents they will require from you to make our record complete. You may uh, take your leave and have a good afternoon. Honorable members, thank we you. will thank uh, now... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. As the nominee leaves, it is now 1.20. Break for lunch for one hour. We resume at 2.20. 2.20. Na mtazamaji huyo amekuwa ni waziri mteule katika wizara ya fedha na mipango 
uh, kufika mbele ya kamati ya uteuzi uh, katika lezo zima la kusailiwa yeye ndiye amekuwa wa pili uh, na amekuwa ime, imekuwa uh, zoezi uh, le, ambalo limeweza ku um, wa, wa, wanachama wameweza kuuliza maswali mengi lakini lililoibuka zaidi hapo ama jambo ambalo limeonekana kama kumlemea waziri huyu ni jambo lile la uh, kashfa ile ya ya Grand Regency wakati huo akiwa yeye ni uh, gavana benki kuu ya Kenya uh, wabunge hapo wameonekana kulizamia kwa undani hasa uh, swala hilo uh, maswala mengine pia ambayo yamebuliwa ni kuhusu jinsi ya kuinua uchumi ambao kwa sasa wa Kenya wengi wanaonekana kulemewa na uchumi uh, maswala kuhusu ushuru wa utakao tozwa pengine kama ni wa Kenya ama biashara uh, wakiuliza iwapo itakuwa vyema kuongeza ushuru kwa Mkenya ambaye kwa sasa maisha memleme lakini waziri amesema yeye kama waziri ama kama um, uh, aliye mwana uchumi basi hangeweza kupendekeza uh, kuongezwa kwa ushuru uh, kwa mwananchi wa kawaida kizingatiwa kwamba uh, uchumi imekuwa mbaya ama hali ya maisha imemlemea wabunge vile vile pia wameweza kujitetea kuhusu masuala kadhaa ambayo yamekuwa yakionekana katika shughuli za bunge hususan katika kupitishwa kwa bajeti wakisema kwamba wizara ya fedha mara nyingi haiandamani ama haielezei vyema ni masuala gani wange enda kuzingatia zaidi manake kuna maswala ambayo wanapeana wana katika statements zao lakini ikifika bunge jinsi watakavyozungumzia basi ikifika ule upande wa pili inabadilishwa ni swala ambalo wabunge wameonekana kukerwa nalo na kumtaka waziri ajieleze iwapo atajitolea kuhakikisha kwamba uh, bunge linafanya uh, ama lina, 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 linafanya uh, jawabu lake ama jukumu lake kama ipasavyo na kwamba wizara ya fedha itaweza kuheshimu nafasi ya bunge katika swala hilo swala la CDF pia ambalo limeonekana kwa kera bunge pia limezungumziwa hapa wakimtaja waziri ajeleze kinagaubaga iwapo yeye ata ataruhusu CDF iendelee ama NGCDF iendelee ama yeye pia atazungumza uh, kama waziri wa sasa wa fedha ukuria tena ambaye alisema hatotoa pesa za kufadhili uh, mradi huu wa NGCDF. Kwa hivyo ni mengi ambayo yamezungumziwa ndiye amekuwa waziri mteule wa pili kufika mbele ya kamati hii. Mchana atakuwa anaingia Davis Chirchir ambaye ameteuliwa katika Wizara ya Kawi uh, ama kupenda Energy and Petroleum ndiye atakayekuwa anafika mbele ya kamati hii saa unusu. Lakini kwa sasa mtazamaji kama ulivyofuatilia mazungumzo haya mmoja na kwanja mmoja kwa moja basi ni baadhi tu ya masuala ambayo nimeweza kukutajia tu lakini ni mengi yaliyozungumziwa tutakuwa tunakuandalia kwenye taarifa zetu za baadaye lakini kwa sasa ni ruhusu nikupishe kwa mwanahabari mwenza Erin Muchuma Odim ambaye ana mengi kuhusiana taarifa mbalimbali za humu nchini katika taarifa zetu za lunch time news kwako Muchuma programs that we have for the benefit of the people of Kajiado as we do for the people of Kenya. Ya pili, mimi nimekuja hapa leo kwa sababu ya shughuli hii ya muhimu. Mnakumbuka nilizungumza mara nyingi kuhusu mpango wa housing. And I meant every word that I said. Uh, mambo ya housing ni mambo ya muhimu sana katika awamu hii ya serikali ya Kenya na ni muhimu not by default not by accident but by design 
tuko na makusudi ya mambo ya mpango ya housing kwa sababu ya mambo manne ya kwanza ni kwa sababu housing inatupatia nafasi ya kila mkenya kuwa na nyumba mahali pazuri pa kuishi jambo la pili inatupatia nafasi ya ajira mumesikia hapa tumekuwa na carpenters tumekuwa na plumbers tumekuwa na engineers tumekuwa na waseremala na wale wengine wote inatupatia nafasi ya kuajiri wa Kenya wengi katika sehemu hii na jambo la tatu vile vile inatupatia nafasi ya kuondoa changamoto katika sehemu zetu za kilimo ili tusi, tuanze ile program ya land consolidation watu waweze tuweze kupata nafasi ya eh, kilimo ili tusitumie sehemu zetu za kilimo na kuzalisha chakula kama sehemu ya makao the whole project of um, uh, ensuring that we do not engage land men for food production for human settlement is the way forward in our economy and therefore the whole program ya mambo ya housing is because we want to make sure that we use the resources we have well and we make sure that we develop those resources in a manner that benefits all the citizens of Kenya affordable housing inawezesha mtu seremala kama huyu bwana Ocheng awe ni mwenye nyumba hapa Nairobi pale nyuma watu wenye walikuwa wanaweza kununua nyumba ni mtu wako na kazi kubwa ni mtu anafanya kwa bank mtu anafanya KRA mtu anafanya kwa wizara ndio walikuwa wananunua nyumba sasa tunataka iwezekane na mimi nataka ni wahakikishie wale mahasla wa seremala wale mafundi ya eh, kule kijijini watu ya boda boda na hata ule anauza mboga atapata nafasi ya kununua nyumba na tutahakikisha ya kwamba iko nyumba inatoshana na kila mkenya ndio sababu tumesema tutakuwa na viwango tofauti mbalimbali mbali. tutakuwa na social housing tutakuwa na rent to, uh, to own housing tutakuwa na affordable housing na tutakuwa na manyumba zile zingine ambazo wakenya wengine wanaweza pia kununua the program here is so that we leave no kenyan behind nimekuja hapa makusudi vile vile ili ndugu zetu wa kings developers wajue ya kwamba hata kama hii project ni private kati yao na wale walipatiana ardhi hii serikali ya Kenya itasimama na wao kuwatafutia wale watakaoishi katika hizi manyumba kwa sababu iko katika ile kiwango ambayo wa Kenya wengi wanaweza kufikia and i want to encourage other developers and other land owners that this project of affordable housing is not just a project of the government of Kenya it is a combined project it is a project that we want the private sector we want private land owners to come on board to provide units that are in the category of uh, affordable housing and we are going to support them using our bomayangu platform to ensure that you have uh, buyers of those units and we are going to arrange mortgage so that those houses you are building have buyers so other developers wale wa Kenya wengine wako na ardhi private sector developers wengine ambao wako na uwezo tunataka tushirikiane yale mambo tunataka ni mambo mawili tunataka nyumba ijengwe yenye iko na gharama ya chini ndio tuweze kuhakikisha kwamba wa, wa Kenya wa kila eh, kiwango wanaweza kupata mahali pa kuishi na jambo la pili tunataka to standardize ile products ambazo tunatumia katika mijengo hii ndio tuweze kupunguza gharama ya ujenzi wa hizi manyumba to standardize milango to standardize madirisha 
to standardize all the other products. I think the ministry tells me we have 69 products that will be standardized.